I'm sorry, it looks that part of the lecture was not recorded. So uh, perhaps I start the, uh, it once again. I'm sorry, that is for the purpose of the, uh, for those of you who will be watching on the depicted. So, we, so I will repeat uh, maybe in abbreviated version what I said until now. Uh, this part of my lectures I call seeing through the painting. And uh, we spent the last uh, considerable part of last lecture talking about the how the physics of the painting, how it is being made and how the light is interacting with the painting in order to produce the, what the artist wanted us to see on that given picture. But this is already a first quarter of a 21st century. And uh, since the end of the 19th century, we learn that we can not only look at the object employing the visible part of electromagnetic spectrum, which we call a visible light, but we can also look through the objects using, for example, the shorter part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which has been, which is now called the X-ray uh, Röntgen radiation, which was discovered at the end of the 19th century by Konrad Röntgen. And uh, we all most probably have an experience with the use of the X-rays for the medical purposes, but the X-rays can also be used to seeing through the picture of the, which we can see in the museum. And it is invaluable tool of analyzing the pictures, for example, by the grand masters, the pictures which when they, when they are attributed to the grand masters of the past, may cost the fortune. What you see on this slide, on the left side of it, is a picture of a young girl reading, from reading from the National Gallery in Washington, DC, which was painted in the 18th century by Fragonard. And uh, this is a black and white version of the picture for the reason that if I will show you the color picture, it will be less clear how that compare with what you see on the right side of the slide, which is the X radiography of the same picture, which is also shown in the National Gallery in Washington, DC. As you see on this right side, on the right part of the picture, there, this picture has, so to say, the other life. There is another picture underneath and, um, it is obvious that Mr. Fragonard have used the already existing picture or a first version of his final piece of art uh, as a support on which the final version of the picture was painted. Why that had happened? There are various reasons for it. But painting was always an expensive endeavor. It cost a lot of money to have a proper support, a proper ingredients, which we discussed last time, the pigments, the, the solvents, which you were used to dissolve pigment to create the paint and all that, that was pretty much expensive for well, very often, the artists just could not afford to keep the ready made picture, which they consider not to be of a sufficient quality and uh, start from a scratch, buying a new material, new support and everything for a new picture. So they use the existing pictures as the support for the new ones. And uh, that is, for example, what we see. And very often the artist 
they change the composition of the picture during the act of creating the piece of art and uh, therefore they cover it and with the paint and with the x-rays we can see through the existing final product and in some sense a see the history how the picture has been created uh, Wait, sorry, the uh, yes uh, they are uh, first covering the the, the with the i cannot screen. hear you can you speak louder uh, sorry uh, can you can you hear me yes now i can hear you uh, uh, when when they uh, make the new pic, uh, new paint a uh, previous one is covered with the white paint or no 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 like the, or... the original picture is of course black is colored on the left side but i am showing it the, as a black and white because it's just easier to compare the yeah, black the, with... the be behind yeah. picture a uh, behind paint is oh, the... The, the behind yeah it it is of course colored yes but the, uh, the, this is much more tricky how to find out the color of the, so to say, the under layer, right? Because the, uh, uh, there is, a, in order to paint over the existing picture, the, 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 the new version of this uh, uh, glue and things are usually put on the, on the painting. And therefore, the, the, it is possible, but not so well and so accurate as the shapes which we can, uh, uh, which the experts can, uh, can, I mean, the extradiography experts can, can see. So in most of the cases, you see the shadow, so to say, what, what was before, not the, not the true colors. That was a very good question. Yes. All right. Uh, thank Did you that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. So uh, let me let me show you another example. This is much more uh, uh, important picture. It's a picture of the Van Dyck from the 17th century. Is a Saint Rosaline interceding from a plaque street in Palermo. It's again oil on canvas, and it is from the Metropolitan Art Museum in uh, New York. And below it's the ex radiography of it. And as you see, they are completely different pictures. And actually what was probably underneath was the auto portrait of the Van Dyck. So he had a loss of the auto portrait and he must have used one of those as the support for uh, for his uh, for his uh, for his pictures. But that 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 this is not only the something which has been done. Uh, uh, okay, let me sh first. I mean, this is a technical slide which shows a various. X-ray techniques used to analyze the uh, the, the paintings, and uh, the discussion of it is uh, is rather simple. I mean, I believe that the physicists and uh, and people who 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 are busy with the applications, for example, of X-rays or whatever radiation to uh, different uh, in different branches of science can easily understand from the picture what is the difference between those different ways. And um, of course, a tremendous progress was achieved in the second half of the 20th century when the X-ray tomography was made possible by the, uh, well, not so much a progress in the generating and recording x-rays, but the progress was made in the computer sciences and uh, the sufficiently powerful and fast and cheap computers were available. The other 
problem with the technical side of the X radiation and the other radiation method used to analyze the paintings, seeing through the paintings, is that usually the paintings are stored in the museums. They are either on the exhibits or in the storage rooms, but in whatever place they are, the museums are very unhappy with sending the treasury uh, to the laboratories for ex examination. So the, in the 20s of the 19th, of the 20th century, in the beginning of the X-ray techniques development, the, uh, that was very infrequent that the, that the important pieces of art were actually examined by those devices for that requires taking a, a painting, important painting from a museum and shipping it in the armored cars to the laboratory and to, well, there were lots of the stories and there's also lots of the, uh, uh, um, uh, films and books about how that results in the stealing of the important uh, pictures and pieces of art. So uh, they re the fact that we have now a essentially a portable uh, a tomography equipment with which can be moved to a given museum to examine or to the given gallery to examine the, the picture, that is a tremendous progress. So that is the technique, technical part. And uh, this is the very modern painting. It's the Lady with the Soup uh, by Pablo Picasso. And uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, it is in the, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, as far as I remember, it's in the Ontario, in the national, one of the museums in Ontario. And what you will see on the right is uh, X radiography of the, uh, of the, of the same picture and uh, pay attention to what is in the middle. It is obvious that the, that the final picture by Picasso was painted by Picasso on another picture where there was a female person in the middle, so to say, between the child and the lady with the soap. And he had repainted it, removed that, using the hair of the previously painted character as a steam coming out from the bowl of the soup. So as you see, even much more recently paint, paint artists, not in the 16th or 17th century, they were that the X-ray can reveal that they also basically behave in the same way. They repaint and correct or use the old paintings as a support for the new one. And uh, the reason why I'm showing is, is that these techniques are very important in the in discovering whether the given painting is real or it's a forged piece of art. So we will be now, I would like to tell you a few story, a few words about the forged art now. So what requires a, to be a good forger? Uh, basically three things. You have a good knowledge of a history of a period from which the forged art originated. 
you wanted to make a picture, uh, the painting, which will be the, which will be from this, you attempt to sell as a picture from a 16th or a 15th century. So you better know very well the history of that period, what conceivably could be the subject of the painting, and also how the paintings were made, where, what were the technical, technicalities of the initial drawings, etc., on the painting uh, by the artists from that time. The other thing which you have to know is you have to knew very well uh, what was the physics and the chemistry of a material use of that period. We will discuss that in a greater detail in a few minutes. And sure enough, the final uh, thing is that you have a good artistic skills. So the painting you made <clears throat> is really of a good quality because otherwise nobody will, will want to buy it from you. Uh, this is actually a, a painting by probably the most famous uh, uh, forger of the art in the history, a certain Dutch painter, Han von Megeren. Uh, Han von Megeren was, uh, was uh, the, the, this is called the Supper of Emmaus, and it has been painted by the Han von Megeren in the 1937 and sold by him. And it has been uh, one of the most important examples in the ex special exhibit in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in the third, in, uh, just before the war, with the Second World War, which was the exhibition completely devoted to the famous Flemish painter Jan Vermeer, and the the picture was so well forged that it was considered to be the one of the best paintings of Vermeer, and it it has been forged. Han von Megeren had been interesting person from the other point of view, for he has been also an accomplished artist by himself. He was famous for making a beautiful drawings. And he decided, I apologize for the noise, there is a, some kind of a construction going in the building. And, uh, he, he Megaren decided that he's not recognized sufficiently by the artist community and decided to become a forger. And he was extremely well accomplished. He made a lot of these paintings and uh, that almost led him to the, to the gallows for he, his, one of his forged paintings was bought during the second war by uh, Hermann Goering. And it was considered by him to be the, the must, one of the main masterpieces in his uh, collection of a bought or stolen art. And uh, after the war, Van Megeren was arrested for collaboration with the Nazi and he actually was almost sentenced to death by the Dutch court. And in order to save his life, he confesses that he did not sold a real 17th century picture to from Goering, but that it was just a forgery that he painted. And because that was a minor crime 
as compared to the collaboration, at least in the 45 or 46, he was only sentenced for a year in prison. But that is the very famous pain, uh, uh, the, one, the most famous forgery of the paintings in the history so far, at least. As we know now, by the use of various modern techniques like the X radiography and so forth, the forgeries by Van Megeren were essentially extremely bad as far as technicality is concerned. He did not pay any specific attention to being very careful with using materials. He occasionally was painting his forgeries on top of the original paintings from the Flemish period. He, he essentially was only forging the, uh, uh, the, the paintings from the famous Flemish period. And uh, he was buying a cheap pictures from that time and painting his own contribution to the art, so to say, on the old, all the old ones. Uh, but the, uh, so how do we find out that the given piece of art is not actually a forgery? Uh, there, are, there are lots of forgeries of the, from the Flemish period, as I said, of a, which is a 15th century. And at that time, uh, the most of the art in that period was painted on the oak. The support was oak wood. And it is very difficult to forge the support made out of oak because the age of that support can be easily checked by dendrochronology. As you know, some trees have these three rings inside and the lots of we know exactly we know exactly uh, how the uh, those rings grow in time so by by looking at the cuts of the wood and how those rings are there we can with a sufficient accuracy establish at what period of time the support was made so if the support is much younger than the claimed time of the picture, then we know that this is a forgery. But the dendrochronology is not always a good way of checking the support because for example, in Italy from the same period of time, the most of the paintings were made on the poplar support and the poplar tree does not have ring. So the dendrochronology is not applicable to the paintings made on the poplar. Uh, but there is a historical tool to find it because in the 16th century, a painting profession was uh, actually a monopoly. There was the guild of artists, and there was also the guild of those who produce the panels out of which the support was cut. And the artists were purchasing uh, volumes of those panels, and if we have a picture which attempts to be from a, the same period of time that the picture uh, we are sure has been painted at that period of time, then by comparing from which, so to say, from which 
who had made this set of panels uh, from which companies selling those panels to the artists, uh, the, the, the support came. We can find out whether this is a forged picture or not the forged picture. But today we have much more accurate method of finding whether a piece of art was forged or not. And this is a history of pigments. On the table on the left, there is a history of a blue pigment use. It starts in the 18th century, in the 17th, uh, where the Persian blue ferric was used as a, for the first time as a pigment. And you have a column of others. The beginning of the 19th century is a cobalt blue. The mid of the uh, 19th century is a cerulean blue, which, and in the essentially mid of the 20th century is manganese blue. So if we, we, we now can, using the X-rays, find out what is the pigment, what is a chemical kind of pigment which is on a given picture. And if we have a picture which pretends to be from the, say, 16th century, and which is using a manganese blue, then we know that this is a forger. Uh, on the right side, there is a history of using a titanium white. I already have shown you the, that the titanium white is extremely important uh, pigment uh, in the history of art. And here is a much more detail than uh, the left side, a table of, uh, of a titanium white pigments development. In 18th century, the titanium was discovered. So if we have a picture which pretends to be from the 16th century and which we can find using a modern forensic method essentially, that it is using a titanium white, then we know that it could, that in most most probably is a forgery. And uh, there are lots of the pigments which, con which are based on the titanium dioxide. And uh, the last one on my, on my table is uh, the production of a high quality rotile pigment. That is the important thing. This is a pigment which was made available in the middle of a 20th century. And um, what you see here is a picture of a Mikhail Larionov. Mikhail Larionov was uh, a very, what was actually a, a first modern painter in the, in the Russian, in Russia. He uh, had left Russia in 1915, he went to Paris and he was the artist in residence of the famous Ballet de Russe of Digalev and was a scenographer for them. And uh, he was famous for various modern pastels. And here are the two examples in the Dancer in Emotion from a 15th, 1915, and the lady with the fan from the 1916. And Larionov has left Russia in 1915 and never was back from that time. And he died in 1964. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And, um,
and in 19 the pastels of the those who found them claimed that they were made by the Mikhail Larionov were found in Moscow and all of those pastels were claimed to be dated from before the 1940. And the, those who found those pastels attempted to sell them on the open market. And well, unfortunately, the forgers have used a pastels containing it, this rotiled uh, version of a titanium dioxide, and that was invented in the 1570s. So that was very easily proven to be a faked and forged piece of art. So uh, the modern physics help us to distinguish between the forgery and the and the real real art. Uh, all right. So we have been talking about the paintings, but I would like to say a few words about the color glass. Uh, This is a picture of obsidian. A glass does not appear in the nature except of the volcanic kind of glass called obsidian. This is the picture of it. And obsidian was the first material out of which a sharp knife, so to say, could have been manufactured. And the civilization living in the areas which used to be the volcanic, where they were able to find obsidian in a considerable amount, were developing much faster because they have the sharp cutting devices available. And uh, the glass is actually, uh, I'm talking about the common glass. It is uh, silicon oxide, and that is the lattice structure, well, lattice as network structure of the, of the original glass. The red points are atoms of silica, silicon and the blue ones are the of oxygen. And uh, the history, how the, how the glass was discovered is attributed to the Phoenician sailors who have been shipping uh, soda, sodium blocks on the Mediterranean. And when they were they were making a, a fire somewhere on the sandy beach and they didn't have sufficient amount of wood to make the, the, this, the proper oven for cooking something. So they put up a, the, the stucker on the on a, on a two pieces of soda blocks and after they supper, they went to sleep and the fire was still going on and the soda blocks melted. And in the morning they found in the ash of the, of the fire, the a pieces of glass because there was sufficiently high temperature and the soda blocks uh, which lowered the temperature for fusing a silicon 
uh, in oxygen to make a silica glass was achieved and the piece of glass was found. Whether this is true or not, that I don't know, but the glass is a substance which has been manufactured by the humans since God knows what time. And uh, it mostly be used in the form of a uh, bets out of which uh, primitive jewelry, for example, was made. And the tremendous development of a glass industry was already in the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th century. But the true beginning of artistic use of glass was the Renaissance, where the Venetians started to make a colored glass and produce the items of everyday use out of glass, which were also the pieces of art. And since uh, making a glass is uh, a procedure which requires a very high temperature because this silica glass uh, melts at the temperature of, a fifth, of the order of 1500 degrees Celsius, then uh, it was and it is slightly dangerous procedure. And uh, the glass blowers of Venetia were banned from operating inside of the city. And they moved to a little island, Murano Island, which is a half an hour by boat on the Laguna from the, from the main city of Venice. And the Murano was and is a place of the, where the very beautiful and also pretty expensive glass items are still being made. I'm showing you just the uh, wine glasses from Murano. And we will, the reason why I choose the wine glasses for showing you the production of a glass in Murano will become clear in a moment. But as I said, the making a glass was already a common procedure in the Middle Ages, and that is the uh, Saint. Uh, this is a stained glass from the Cathedral of Chartres. Cathedral of Chartres was built between nineteen uh, at, the, at the beginning of the thirteenth century, and uh, this is the most beautiful uh, stained glass there. And uh, this is actually an Im incredible place, the, the Cathedral of Chartres. If you, it's, it's close to Paris, so it's, uh, it's a half of a day or a day excursion if you visit Paris. It, uh, if you drive, not on the superhighway, but if you just take an old road, country road, which goes to, from Paris to, to, to Chartres, then you drive and all over the southern or the horizon, you see the tip of the cathedral. And when you approach it, it's, it emerges, so to say, on the horizon. It grows up on the horizon because it's, the city is in a, in a little depression. And the, so you, it, it is a remarkable view. I mean, it was a, a, actually a common trick of the of the architects of the medieval cathedrals to build them in the little depression. And we have one of those examples in Poland. If you will ever visit a town of Lejais on the south east of Poland, then you will have the same impression by driving towards Lejais that you first see the tip of a cathedral on the horizon and then the tip of it. And then the whole 
edifies emerges uh, on the horizon. Lezhensk is actually a cathedral which is important for the other uh, piece of art in there. It's the uh, it's one of those three giant organs which are there in Poland. We have now three main new organs in Poland. The one is in the Oliva, it's in Gdansk region, which is this fantastic uh, organs with the moving of moving figures of uh, saints and uh, angels blowing pipes and so forth. The, the biggest one is in the Pomernstein in the Kamień Pomorski, which is on the uh, on the Baltic shore, on the western part of our Baltic shore. And the Lezhysk is also remarkable because the, in the organs which are there, there are the little wooden birds which float in the air, blown air from the pipes of the organs. So when the fortissimo is being played on the organs, those wooden birds appear from inside of the structure of the organs and they flow in the they are hanging on top of it. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And also the Lezhysk Cathedral has a fantastic acoustic. So lots of the records have been, uh, which requires for the best quality of recording to be really recorded in the, in the cathedral, not in the electronically created cathedral, they have been recorded in, in Lezhysk. But anyway, this is the stained glass from a uh, shard uh, cathedral. And uh, the stained glass uh, is, uh, is a really incredible piece of technology. The technology of blowing glass is, has not been changed basically in the history. You have to first make a glass. And if you want to make it having a different, different color, you have to add something to the to the to the silicon oxide. The, in most of the cases, these are the oxides of different metals, which provides a given color to the glass. And the stained glass are either made such that the different piece colors of glass of different colors are put next to each other into the lead frames or the pieces of glass of a different color are fused together by a tem in the oven. And uh, this technique of fusing uh, has been, uh, we, we, we will be talking, we will see in a moment that he's been recreated at the end of the 19th century by a certain art French artist Gallet and we will be talking about it in a moment, but that is a stained glass from Chart. And um, this is another piece of the stained glass. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a stained glass of Bishop of Lambrecht from Maastricht, which is from the 16th century. And uh, as you see, it is much less color it's actually white and yellow. But that is a remarkable stained glass from the point of view that it has, as you see, that it has the landscape on it. And, uh, the, uh, and this is not the window stained glass. It's not, it wasn't built to be a piece part of the window. It was, uh, so to say, a portable piece of art. It uh, could be in the in the wall in the glassy front of a cabinet, or it was just to be a a piece of glass item put up on a in a groom in a proper way, so the light was passing through it. Well, anyway, this is another piece of the famous stained glass. And 
as you see, the technique here is easily visible. You have a different pieces of glass put up in this lead ring, which holds this glass structure together. But the stained glasses are made until essentially now. This is the most famous stained glass in Poland and one of the most beautiful modern stained glasses we have in, the, in Europe. It is a, a stained glass uh, uh, by Stanisław Wyspiański. And it, you can see it in the Franciscan's church in Krakow. The picture, the, the stained glass was made in 1904. It was planned and uh, structure of it and the colors have been chosen by the artist, but the real glass was produced by a, a Tiroler glassmellerei und Mosaic from Anstatt in Innsbruck. And uh, it was shipped to Krakow. Actually, if you go to the Franciscan's church in Krakow, there are also other four stained glasses made by Stanisław Wyspiański. Uh, three of them are actually Stanisław Wyspiański glass, but the fourth one, uh, for reasons which I'm not familiar with, were not accepted by the Franciscans. And uh, this fourth stained glass is, uh, was made by the another crack of artists, I, 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 I have forgotten. It's the name of the individual I, for what I apologize. But um, for those of you who are, who are not from Poland, let me give you a few words about the Stanisław Wyspiański. Wyspiański is probably one of the most important uh, giants of the culture of our country. He was not only the painter, sculptor, the stained glass creator, but he was also a poet. And uh, his uh, contribution to the, to the Polish culture is, I mean, it, it, it in some sense does not have a limit. He had written a theater play called A Wedding, a Vesele, which uh, is so important that until today, if there are other artists who wants to, who attempt to shake up the cultural stage of this country in a, similarly to how the original play by Wyspiański have shaken up the culture and not on the stage of Poland, the, they, they call the pieces of art a wedding. We just have the a new movie shown on the, in the movies all over the country by Mr. Swarzowski, which is also called Wedding. And it's actually a second movie of that director, which is also called Wedding. Wyspiański was, was a true giant, and we will be talking slightly more about that stained glass in a moment. But this is the other stained glass from the same period. It's from St. Per and Paul Church in Ostenda in Belgium. And uh, this is the, the stained glass from basically the same period. And as you see, it's uh, completely different. It tries to mimic the Middle Ages stained glass in the cathedral. And it is cathedral which is younger than the Franciscaner church in Krakow. And, uh, and the Wyspiański stained glass, the, which by the way, this, uh, this glass stained glass, I forgot to put the name of it, I just realized, 
It is called the Godfather creating the world. And that title is important for understanding that stained glass. But then let's look at the stained glass again. As I said, its title is a Godfather is creating the world. As you know, and the, the word creation by the God is a time consuming process in the Bible. It takes six days to create the world. So the various stages of creating the universe is uh, associated with a given moment of time. And if you, if you look at this particular pic, stained glass, you can easily see that all of those phases of creating the world, this biblical creating of the world, are put up on that stained glass. Here you have a creation of a water. Here you have the other stages of creating the world. So this is an attempt to create the illusion of a time process on the two-dimensional space. We, as you remember, I have sort of defined a painting as a attempt to make illusion of a more dimensional space on a two dimension canvas or a two dimension support. And here you have the, a, an attempt to show the illusion of the time process on the two dimension world. And we will be talking more about the same idea, which was at the same period of time, emerging in the other uh, part of the Europe. And uh, we will discuss in more detail why that, how that idea of having this illusion of a time process on a two dimension space, simultaneous illusion of a certain time process is of a importance. All right. So let's continue about the colored glasses. And uh, I started with the Murano wine glasses. And let me now show you as something which you cannot see nowadays, because even if the museums have it, they are stored in the lead containers because we are so afraid now of any traces of radioactivity, not even knowing that if we are really scared of radioactivity that we should cover ourselves with the lead uniforms because our body is radioactive. We have a few thousand of becquerels of the radioactive material in our bones. So I'm going to talk about the uranium glass. Uranium glass is a, this is a kind of a cookie spatter made of the of the glass, uh, which was built with a uh, amount of a radioactive clay from the mines in Yakimov in today, uh, which was the same place out of which the material used by the Maria Skrodowska Curie was used in her work, her and her husband work on discovery of the red, radium and polonium. And that is the glass when is illuminated with the ultraviolet light or the light which contains a con higher than normal 
intensity of ultraviolet radiation, then it has this kind of greenish view. I mean, it, it looks like in this greenish view light. And this is the jewelry made of the same kind of glass. This glass is radioactive, not very much. And it's it, for years and years, for since uh, the Venetian gas blowers learned that they can color the glass by adding oxides of uh, metals and adding the, the clay from the Yakimov to the glass, which produces that different color. And nobody have really had any serious problem, had problems by either using those glass items or having that jewelry. But that is now, of course, considered to be uh, illegal to use it. And that is, uh, this, this is a recipe how to make the uranium glass, which goes, comes from the company, American company, Mount Washington Glass Company, which manufactures something what the collection of a uranium glass items, which they called Burmese glass. And here is uh, what is needed to make the uranium glass. And, uh, and there are lots of items, but it contains uh, two pounds of the, for the hundred pounds of the white sands, you have a two pounds, so about the 2% of the uranium oxide. And uranium oxide is, is weakly radioactive, but it's sufficient to create that color. But this, uh, this is not the only glass which is radioactive. You might have heard the name Baccarat glasses. The Baccarat is a, is a town in France, which is famous for making all sorts of beautiful glass items. And one of the famous glass from this Baccarat are the Rhine, Rhine wine glasses. And the Rhine wine glasses from Baccarat are having a different colors. It's a crystal glass, which has uh, various different colors, beautiful colors. And uh, most of those colors are made by adding in a production of a crystal glass, uh, oxides, metal oxides, which are weakly radioactive. So some of those glasses, if not all, are extremely low radioactive. So I used to say that because the Baccarat wine glasses are extremely expensive and I never could afford to buy those glasses, I always dream of having them, but never have it. Uh, so I used to say that if somebody who has a considerable number of those glasses is in afraid of the radioactivity, that I'm willing to take them for safekeeping at the modest uh, price. Uh, the, so there are lots of the, the, the colored glasses are actually of a, are used by the artists to create important pieces of art, contemporary art. And uh, uh, I will finish my story about the colored glass by a story about the Emile Gallet. Emile Gallet was a French uh, artist of Art Nouveau period. And this is, uh, Galet vase, uh, which is um, very typical for his uh, production of the pieces of art. Uh, it's a brownish glass on the 
matte glass. The Galais glass is uh, pretty expensive. The 18 centimeter height glass vase, I checked it yesterday, which is on the, in one of the galleries in Christie Gallery for sale, cost $150,000. So you can calculate how much a one centimeter or a gallet vase costs. And um, how this curve, this kind of glass is made, it is a very ancient technique. It is a technique used by the gas blowers from Murano in the 13th century. Uh, there is a there is a colored glass, for example, the brown one, out of which the vase is made. It's cooled. So it's just a ready-made vase. Then the other color glass, in this case, a white one, is blown inside of the existing vase. And then everything is put up in the oven where these two layers of glass fuse together. When then the glass is cooled again, the diamond cutters are used to cut the outer shell of the glass, leaving those flowers on the side. How the matte color of the glass is achieved, uh, if it will be just uh, on the matte surface, that will be easy to do this with the diamond, with the pieces, little pieces of diamond covered paper with which you can move it around the glass and destroy the, the surface of it. But in the 13th century, the Murano glass blowers found that if the sand they used to producing the glass is not clear, it contains some other kind of glass. The, the product is having not uniform quality. It's not translucent uniformly on the whole surface. So they had invented a technique of cleaning up the sun before it's being used for making the glass. And uh, what Galet did, he reversed that technique. He added sufficient amount of the other kind of sand to the glass which was then blown and made, it was automatically mad. So this is the Galais glass. And uh, there are even companies nowadays in Poland, which make the glass, gla Galais-like glass vases. And uh, they are of course much, much, much cheaper than this one at the Christie, which I just have mentioned. And the other glass creator, which I would like to uh, mention is American glass blower, Louis Tiffany. And some of you might, might have seen the movie, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany with the Audrey Hepburn, which is based on the Truman Capote novel of the same title. And Tiffany was, um, was a very famous uh, artist in the United States in the 19th century when the President Arthur uh, refused to move into the White House after he was elected. 
and requested that the White House be redecorated. The redecoration was uh, 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 assigned to Mr. Tiffany, and he made complete rebuild. He completely rebuilt the inside of the White House and produces a giant stained glasses entrance to the White House. And um, that has been all removed by the another remodel, remodeling of the White House ordered by the Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he moved to the White House. And then the White House, it is the Roosevelt White House, which is in this federal style, which is nowadays, and this glassy entrance is gone. And the, uh, the, uh, the Tiffany glass, which is one of these examples at the bottom, is a painted glass. He used a, a special technique of very uh, accurate painting of uh, this, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, of this glass. And uh, the characteristic are these black lines which looks like the this lead frames from the stained glasses, but they are just being painted. All right, so that is um, the end of this the colored glasses and how the pictures are being created. And I would like to start. Um, a part of our lectures, which will, which will take some time, and under the title of a new geometry. What you see on this slide is um, is actually a, a, a part uh, of the manuscript of the Euclid uh, from the years before, 3,300 years before the, our era. And that is the, the book, which until very recently in the 19th, until the basically 20th century was one of the most read books in the history, uh, just the second to the Bible. It's the textbook on, on geometry. You see here the original drawing by the Euclid. And uh, the, this was the creation of what used to be called the Euclidean geometry. And until the mid of the 19th century, all the science and art were based on the Euclid principles. And uh, this is the uh, uh, I would like to say a few words about the Filippo Brunelleschi. Filippo Brunelleschi was a, a architect painter from the turn of the 14th and 15th century. And what you see on the left is his main contribution to the, our culture. It's a dome of a cathedral in Florence. And in the 1418, Brunelleschi actually won a competition against the other architect, Gilbert, Gilbert, Giberti. Uh, if you will ever be in Florence, you will see that there is a cathedral with that dome, and next to it is the uh, baptism. And the main entrance to the cathedral is facing the, the, uh, the baptism, and the entrance to the baptism, they are just incredibly beautiful metal doors 
which are called doors to heaven. And um, Brunelleschi had won, he lost the competition for the, for the baptisterium, but he won a competition for building the dome. Nobody was able to figure out how to build the dome on this giant cathedral at that time. And he had invented a trick to build a dome. It looks like a dome, but actually a construction of it is not a construction which we nowadays will call a dome. And uh, the Brunelleschi uh, is attributed to the creating the Brunelleschi experiment, which was the way of showing how the perspective, how the illusion on a two dimension piece of paper or canvas or wood of the real landscape can be drawn in such a way that create the impression of a three dimensionality in the picture. And this is a drawing which is intended to remind you how the perspective is generated. And what you see on the right is uh, uh, Thomas Masiaco, the, well, I'm sorry, I have not translated it. It's the, the, the picture uh, uh, from the uh, 15th century, which uh, already uh, tries to use the Brunelleschi principle of perspective on his picture. The, this is the one of the first, the most beautiful pictures which already uses the principles of a perspective. It's the ideal city from uh, 1475 by Piero della Francesco. And uh, that you can easily see on that picture that it, it, it has the perspective built in it. And the, uh, and the artists are until today play with the concept of the, of the, of the perspective. So here I am showing you a few of the photographs and paintings by Felice Variani. Uh, on the left, there is a, a, the photography of the same ramp in this, I don't know where. Uh, and as you see, they are very different. They view very differently and the perspective on them is quite different. On the right on top, there are, there are elevators in the, in some, I don't know, it was a department store or, no, or, a, or a subway station. And you can easily see how they look differently when painted from a different perspective. And the same is with this uh, illuminated staircase on the bottom right. So the perspective is the use of Euclidean geometry principles in the trying to create the illusion of a real three-dimensional perspective on a piece of paper on a canvas. The perspective is related closely to another phenomenon, which is called shadow. A shadow is a, a projection of a given three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional surface, which depends on where the source of light is located. So the first book about which makes the distinction between the perspective and shadows is the book by Giovanni Battista Armenini. And this is a front page of that book. And uh, of course, the shadows 
are important in the art. And uh, I think I, I like to show you this, this picture, which is a color from the George Lucas Star Wars. That is a, a down of two suns on a planet of Tatuan on which the, the, the fourth item of the Star Wars, which was the first one shown, it has been uh, located. There is, uh, and this is a planet which has two suns. So that was incredible invention of the Lucas that when they, when he was, I mean, they recorded the movie, of course, somewhere in, as far as I remember, it was on the, on the Canary Islands. It's, there is a, there is a area not far from the tip of the, of the, of the, the volcano on the, on the, on the, main island of on the tide this tidy volcano on Tenerife Island there where this was shot the first first the, the fourth item in a in a in a in a in a series of movies but the first one ever shown so that was of course the normal our sun which produces the shadows but somehow they were able to produce on the on the movie uh, shadows on the surface of a tattoo and how they will look like when there were two suns on the on that planet and how the shadows of the objects will look like on that planet and that is the the, the the one of the pictures from that from that movie. So that was the a short course of the Euclidean geometry use in the creating the fundamental concepts in the art, the perspective, and the shadows. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that should be later on, but. Let me then, before I go further, and actually we will stop at that moment for I have to slightly leave earlier today. Let me remind you the Euclid postulates. The first is that it is postulated to draw a straight line from any point to any point. It is postulated that it is possible to produce extended and to extend the finite straight line continuously. Uh, the third postulate is to describe a circle with any certain and distance. The distance means radius. The fourth principle is that all right angles are equal to another. And there is a fifth principle which is pretty long, long, and this is the parallel postulate. So instead of those verbal formulation of this postulate, I had prepared for you a short uh, graphic. And basically that is the textbook of the geometry for the high schools already made because there is nothing else in the geometry in the high school we teach kids, then the that is not already explained on this. This is a first postulate. It's a, it's a straight line between two points. This is that we can extend it to infinity. That is that we have the circle. That is that all the angles, straight angles are right angles are equal to each other. And this is this complicated definition of the 
fifth parallel, which is much simple, that if I have a straight line and the point outside of it, then I can draw one and only one parallel line, the line through that point, which is parallel to that one. That is, it will never cross this thick black line. So these are Euclid postulates. And people thought that there is nothing else which can be add to it them or change in them until in uh, 1854, Bernard Riemann, oh, what happened? Okay, it's again. This is in, until the, in 1854, Bernard Riemann had published his habilitation work, which we will discuss uh, next week when we meet next week. The Bernard Riemann, uh, maybe, maybe I show it today, but. This is the habilitation of Rarand Riemann called Über die Hypothesen, welche die Geometrie zu Grunden lagen, liegen. And uh, it has been published pretty late in the life of Riemann. He lived very short and um, this is much more known version of that, which is a translation of the Riemann habilitation on the hypothesis which lie on the basis of geometry. A translation was done by William Clifford, another important mathematical mathematician of the 19th century. And uh, that was the, paper in which a fifth principle, fifth postulate of Euclid was questioned. And Riemann was able to show that we can have a consistent geometry where the fifth parallel principle is not applicable. And all those geometries are from the Riemann time Called, are called uh, non-Euclidean geometries. And uh, to close, I, I cannot refuse myself and uh, not to show you something. Uh, it will probably be the only complicated mathematical expression on this lecture. This is a Riemann tensor. Uh, the gammas are what is called in geometry a fine connection coefficients. And uh, this is a fourth rank tensor. And if contracted in a proper way, it generates a tensor which is a, which is a two indices tensor. It's called, Rima, it's called Ricci tensor. And this part, this con con construction of a Riemann of tensor, which is a Ricci tensor minus a trace of the Ricci tensor, which describes a geometry. It contains all the information about the geometry of the space we are discussing. When it is made as a left side of an equation, which right hand side is proportion to the a tensor, which we call the energy momentum tensor, which describe the presence of a matter in that space. G is a gravity constant and C is a velocity of light. 
then we get what is called the Einstein equation. And that the complicated differential equation is the equation which describes the universe. So if you will ever need to understand what was the Riemann contribution to the, our understanding of the world around us, then you always have to remember that it is a Riemann tensor, which is the left-hand side of the Einstein equations, which describes the universe. All right, so uh, let me stop sharing the screen. And, um, and um, thanks for being with me today. And we see each other next week and we will be talking about the non-Euclidean geometry and uh, what happens with it and how that it had contributed to the development of the 19th and 20th century art and literature. Thanks for being with me and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> By the way, the, the recording will be on the same uh, uh, link as before. Bye-bye.